Welcome everyone to our HVAPM CQI webinar today. Uh, please continue to introduce yourself in the chat box and we'll go ahead and get started. I'm Sarah Volker and I serve as the Associate Project Director for HVPM CQI at Education Development Center. And we're so glad that you're all able to join us today to discuss your upcoming CQI plan updates, as well as some strategies that you can use for coaching and supporting LAAs in their CQI work. Uh, we have just a few reminders for you as you're participating in the webinar today. Uh, first, everyone is joining with your phone lines open um, so that you can ask questions and talk with each other. Uh, but to help us manage any outside noise, we are going to ask that you uh, keep yourself on mute until you're ready to talk. Um, you can also post questions or comments uh, using the chat box, which you'll find on the left side of your screen. Uh, please feel free to do that throughout the presentation, and we'll come back to them uh, when we pause for discussion at the end. There is a technical support box. Uh, below the slide deck if you're experiencing any technical issues today. We have people who can support you. We are recording this webinar so that it can be available on the HRSA website to listen to in the future. Um, and finally, you'll see a file share pod on your screen. Um, and in that pod, you will find a copy of the slides for today um, and a number of resource documents that we'll be referencing. And at this time, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Monique Fountain-Hanna, the Chief Medical Officer and CQI and Innovation Advisor at HRSA, to share some opening remarks with us. Monique, are you connected? I am. Good, good afternoon. Um, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so good afternoon again. On behalf of uh, HRSA and the division leadership and staff, I'd, I'd like to welcome you again um, to today's webinar. Um, as was mentioned, this provides important updates on the SBU, FY20 um, CQI plan and review process, as well as um, some support on, on how you might be able to support your local implementing agencies. Um, I want to also express our gratitude to, um, to each of you um, for continuing to partner with us and our computers if you're joining us by phone. Um, so this is really an opportunity for us to, um, to say thank you again for helping us to be able to um, provide and build capacity for states and local implementing agencies um, to utilize continuous quality improvement as a tool and methodology for improving outcomes um, for high-risk families and young children across the state and territories and in your communities. Um, together we've been hard at work at identifying tools and resources that lend themselves to greater improvements and home visiting outcomes. Um, last year, in a summary of your 2018 quality improvement plans, um, your QI efforts were focused on, on topics such as maternal depression, recruitment and referral to service, family retention, breastfeeding, and intimate partner violence, just to name a few. And in response to your ongoing work and identified need for additional support, we created a number of TA supports that address both individual needs with one-on-one -on -one TA and also broader support through written virtual resources um, such as our CQI practicum and the work of our home visiting coin. Um, in this coming year, we're going to continue to listen and learn from you and provide feedback um, to you and gather that input on what you provide to us um, to be able to help us determine what CQI investments um, provide the greatest opportunity for you to continue to move um, the needle forward for your families that you serve. Um, there's a quote on quality improvement by an unknown author that says, practice the philosophy of continuous improvement, get a little better every day. It's our hope that as we continue to practice improving the quality of home visiting services, we will all get a little better every day um, at the work we do on behalf of children and families. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it back over to, to Sarah. Thank you very much. Your microphone has Great. been turned Thank on. Thank you so much, Monique. Um, and if anyone is joining us uh, a couple minutes late today, please do keep your, your phone lines muted um, until you're ready to speak. And if you um, are dialing in on the phone and using your computer, please make sure your computer mics are also um, muted. All right. And I'm pleased to introduce our speakers for today. 
So first, we'll have Julie Lee, Senior Research Associate at James Bell Associates, and HVP and CQITA Specialist for Region 7. Then Jessica Deedling, the McVie Data and Quality Manager for the Louisiana Office of Public Health. Um, and finally, Meredith Martinez, the Family Home Visiting Supervisor for the Minnesota Department of Health. And our objectives for today are to review the process and timeline for submitting your CQI plan updates, review the key components to include in your CQI plan, uh, highlight available TA resources to support the development and implementation of your CQI plan, um, and learn from two awardees as they share their CQI coaching and support strategies. And Julie is going to start us off today, so I will turn things over to her. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. I'm going to cover the first three object objectives during the webinar today, um, and then I'll pass it over to the other speakers. So first, I'll talk about the fiscal year 2020 CQI plan submission process and timeline. The process for CQI plan submissions will be similar to previous years. Updated CQI plans are due to your HRSA project officer via email by February 28th. Next, TA specialists and project officers will review to check that all required components have been addressed, and will offer written feedback and recommendations via email within 13 days. Sorry, 30 days. Your project officer will provide you with a timeline for making any needed revisions to your plan. We'll ask for minor revisions to come back within seven days, and for more extensive revisions, you'll have up to two weeks. TA specialists and project officers will be available to discuss your plan and the feedback provided during this time. We're always happy to jump on a call if you'd like. Next, the TA specialist will review your revised plan and forward on to your project officer for final approval no later than April 30th. Last, once approved by your project officer, you'll receive a request for information to upload the final approved CQI plan in EHB on or before May 22, 2020. So now that we've covered the process for submitting and reviewing CQI plans, we'll talk more about what to include when you're putting together your plan update. In the file pod, you'll see two documents titled Fiscal Year 2020 McVie CQI Plan Update Instructions and Recommended Template. There's both a PDF version and a Word document. This document includes key questions to be addressed in your plan and an optional template for organizing your information. It's not required that you use the template, but we do highly recommend it as a tool to facilitate completion of the key components of the CQI plan and update. That document also provides links to additional resources that can help support your CQI work. The first section of your plan update should focus on key activities, accomplishments, challenges, and lessons learned from implementing your CQI project since the last update. That update will cover the period from February 2019 through January 2020. Please be sure to describe your topics, SMART aims, and progress toward meeting those aims. You should also discuss your use of any technical assistance to support CQI, any actions you've taken to sustain gains realized through your CQI projects, and what lessons you learned that you'll apply to your fiscal year 2020 plan. The second part will address your plans for fiscal year 2020. Again, the document in the file pod can be very helpful with updating this section of your plan. There's um, a lot of points on this slide, and it's going to take me a bit to walk through each of them. But I know that this is a review for many of you who have created these plans in the past, and all of the information I'm covering is included in that fiscal year 2020 McVie CQI plan update instructions and recommended template. So there are nine key components to address in part two. Organizational system and supports includes information about your CQI team, trainings, financial support, and plans to engage technical assistance. You will also be expected to address the extent to which LIA staff and management and home visiting participants are involved in CQI in that section. CQI priorities will include the topics selected for CQI for fiscal year 2020, the reasons those topics were selected, and how they align with state or territory priorities. 
If you're participating in HV COIN 2.0, you should include the specific LIAs who are participating in those topics here in this section. In Part 2, you'll also report on the SMART aims for your fiscal year 20 projects as part of goals and objectives, the changes to be tested, or your plan for identifying changes to test methods and tools that LIAs use in their CQI work, such as process mapping, key driver diagrams, and PDSA cycles. If you're participating in HV COIN 2.0 this year, there's more information in the document about the methods and tools that COIN will be using for you to include as well. You'll also report on how CQI data are collected, reviewed, and analyzed, how you plan to sustain the gains you achieve in your project after it ends, strategies used to spread and scale successful changes to additional LIAs, and in the communication section, you'll address how you will assess progress and provide support to LIAs when needed. There are several TA resources available to assist you in completing your plan. Again, please refer to the file pod, and you'll see the file I was just referring to, the fiscal year 20 MIXI CQI plan update instructions and recommended template document. Again, some of you may have used this template in the past. It has been updated this year to reflect current dates to offer some more detail about how to incorporate HV COIN 2.0 activity, activities into your plan, and you can find that guidance in the appendix and to remind you about considering health equity goals in your work. Also available in the file pod is a document titled Updating Your Fiscal Year 2020 CQI Plan. This resource will be helpful if you want more information on what a CQI plan is and examples of the type of content to address in each section of the plan. This resource might be most helpful for those who are new to creating these CQI updates and plans or who need guidance on the development of a certain section of the plan. Another resource available in the file pod is a recently released brief that highlights strategies from three awardees to, to align sorry, performance measurement and CQI activities. This resource describes recommended activities and provides a template for you to create an individualized plan for integrating your PM and CQI work. And finally, you can always request additional assistance from your project officer and your HVPM CQI TA specialist to support you in a number of ways, from the development of your plan to reviewing it and or support implementing your plan. If you're interested in support with the development or implementation of your plan or you'd like a pre-review before it's officially due, you can include that as a priority in your annual TA priority scan. If you've already finalized your scan, that's totally fine. You can feel free to reach out to your TA specialist, and they can support you with updating the scan. We'll now transition from talking about CQI plan development to implementing those plans, and specifically to how two states are supporting their LIAs and their CQI work. I'm really pleased to turn things over to Jessica Deedling, who will first share Louisiana's approach to providing CQI coaching and support to their LIAs. Great, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Jessica Deedling, and I'm with the Louisiana Office of Public Health Bureau of Family Health, um, who's the state's McV grantee. Um, in my role, I oversee all our data collection and reporting, as well as our state's CQI plan and activities. Um, I've been with McVie for seven years now, um, and when we started, or when I started, we had no CQI experience at all. Um, so rest assured, if you're new to McVie or you're new to CQI, this is possible. <laughs> you can learn how to do these things. Um, but it, I didn't get there alone. Um, we've taken advantage of a lot of the support from HRSA, so a lot of the strategies that I'm going to be sharing today um, have come from TA. Uh, we also have participated in the HRSA CQI practicum, and we are currently participating in the HV Coin Scale project on maternal depression. Um, so a lot of the strategies uh, I'll be sharing, it's come from experience, but also come from participating in, in these projects. So the first strategy I was going to look at is um, frequent and predictable communication. Um, so I've found that 
working with LIAs that we're asking them to push boundaries and get out of their comfort zone quite a bit. So anywhere the meeting that we is now over. All the participants have been disconnected.
in the meeting. Count that happens. So what percent of your LIA is invalid entry by the deadline? Um, and that. Um, and then the other part of that is that um, placing, along with those deadlines, that provides some accountability for the LIAs, but then also making deadlines um, and making an opportunity for the statewide team to provide feedback to the LIAs. So incorporated in the HD Coin website, which is a great feature, is that you can um, give feedback to the LIAs on their, their PDSAs. Um, so we also set deadlines for ourselves to respond to that so that everybody's accountable for, for using the platform um, and making the information available uh, to everybody. And then finally, the last strategy, strategy, and this has been one of the most important I've learned, is to really, in your CQI work, prioritize relationship building. Uh, this is really, I think, uh, something that can get lost, but the most impact that I've seen is when there's strong relationships. Um, and so that can be a strong relationship within the LIA, that those local CQI teams have a strong relationship amongst each other. Uh, this is a strong relationship between the local CQI teams and the statewide CQI teams. Um, and then also strong relationships uh, between teams. Uh, and this makes sense. Home visiting is based on relationships. You're, the program's only as strong as that relationship between the home visitor and their client. Um, and so that's, that's what is going to really resonate uh, with your home visitors and, and your local implementing agencies is, uh, is keeping paralleling that process. Um, and so we, to build relationships, really try to prioritize fun in our meetings. Um, and this seems like it can be an easy task, but oftentimes when we have more content that we need to present than we have time available to present, those fun activities can be the first on the chopping block. Um, and I would just really encourage uh, everybody to to not make that the first on the chopping block, to make sure you have that dedicated time. because. If you think about the meetings you've been to and the ones that the lessons that have really stuck, it's usually coming out of those fun activities and that time where you got to develop relationships with uh, with your peers. Um, so the way that we've incorporated fun into our meetings is we use games that teach CQI principles or focus on team building. Um, so there's the famous coin spinning game. You can Google these terms. Google coin spinning game, and that's a great game that will teach you CQI, um, QI, uh, rapid testing, and uh, collecting QI data. Um, we've also done something called a spaghetti marshmallow challenge, where everyone can compete to build the tallest tower out of spaghetti and marshmallows. Um, we always start our meetings with icebreakers. So we've had people lead the whole group in meditation. Um, so there's calm ways to do icebreakers, but then we've also most recently done a rock, paper, scissors uh, championship round that got really heated. Um, and also making sure you have fun ways to celebrate those successes of the team. Um, you know, it's really easy to lose sight of some successes, especially if you haven't reached your aims. Um, but there's a lot of, of successes that happen along the way to reaching those aims. And even if you don't reach your aim, your, team, your teams have usually made a lot of progress. So really making sure you pause and highlight those in a fun way um, that, that resonates with the team. Um, and then also along the lines of relationship building is really designing your meeting to focus on relationship building. So we uh, you know, definitely focus on our team successes, but we also want to make sure we create a space that's safe to acknowledge the fears and challenges. Um, and there's a lot of ways that you can set up your meeting that makes people feel secure to, to share the challenges they're having. Um, one thing we did recently was at the um, beginning of a meeting, we passed out note cards to everybody, and we had them write down any 
fear or challenge that they were encountering. And it was anonymous. They didn't have to write their name. And then we put all the note cards into a hat, and we pulled um, about three of them um, and read it aloud and then discussed it as a group. Um, and then we were able, as a statewide team, to take the rest of the note cards. And we had a whole inventory of the challenges and fears that people were facing that we could then um, use to, to develop content later on in the project or, or help it guide how we work with the team. Um, we also are really deliberate in how we design the agenda, and we build in a lot of discussion time and small group breakouts. Um, we now have a rule that we're not going to go 30 minutes speaking without um, having a small group discussion or breakout, um, because really uh, what that allows for is not only does it reinforce the knowledge when you can have small group discussions and breakout, but it also um, allows for more peer uh, relationship building amongst each other. Um, we also incorporate storyboards into our meetings. Um, storyboards can be an actual you know, you know, science fair type board. Uh, and this is a time for the teams to allow their creativity uh, as well as visit and see what other people are doing. And finally, I'm going to wrap up. <laughs> uh, we also leave time for team time. So this means this is another thing that really I would encourage you not to cut your, from agenda. You get a lot of excitement and energy at these meetings, but we all know after you leave the meeting, you're, you have a travel lag, you go back home, you ought to catch up on work. So if you can build in time in that meeting for your CQI, local CQI teams to sit and work together and create PDSAs and start designing their PDSAs, um, you can capitalize on the energy that, that you've built during that meeting. Um, so I will end here. Um, again, I really want to encourage everyone to do the provide TA, CQI practicum, and HD coin because that's really where we've learned a lot of these lessons. Um, and I'm always available for questions. So thanks. Thank you so much, Jessica. Such a great presentation and um, really awesome strategies. We have a lot of questions coming in. Thank you all for the questions. I should have said before we, um, before I introduce Jessica, that we're going to hold questions till the end. Although Jessica, you're welcome to chat back in the chat pod. But we do have um, 10 minutes for questions after Meredith's presentation. So um, I'll turn it over to Meredith now. Meredith Martinez will share Minnesota's approach to providing CQI coaching and support. Thanks. Go ahead, Meredith. Section. I. Can you hear me? Yes. I'll just keep moving forward. <laughs> um, so I supervise a team that's responsible for our continuous quality improvement activities for our home visiting as well as our grants management. Um, really, we do have a continuous quality improvement coordinator, Hannah Simmons. Um, and she wasn't able to be here today. Otherwise, she would be the one presenting these slides. She's responsible for all of the great work um, that we've done around um, CQI and, that, um, and for really providing that technical assistance to our LIAs. So um, she is uh, the person to go to if you have questions after this presentation. Um, so there's a lot of information on my slides. I'm going to go through them pretty quickly, but hopefully you'll have access to these. Um, after the webinar and can refer back to some of the details on the slides. Um, in Minnesota, we, uh, our McPhee funding uh, supports Healthy Families America and Nurse Family Partnership, um, but we're fortunate to have um, state funding that goes towards evidence-based home visiting as well. Um, and so we also have Family Connects, Early Head Start, Family Spirit, and Parents as Teachers. So just know as I move through this presentation, I'll be talking specifically about MICFI, but also we've integrated our CQI with um, other uh, um, programs, home visiting programs that are funded through state funds. Um, so this uh, visual just really represents how we would, um, how we support our LIAs. We really want them to move from um, creating CQI um, as part of their culture um, to increasing their capacity and their commitment so that there really is some leadership and champions at the local level um, for embedding quality improvement into their everyday. 
We have also worked to um, grow our internal capacity to support CQI here at the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, as I mentioned, we do have one full-time CQI coordinator um, who's funded. Uh, we have part of my time, as well as we have family home visiting nurse consultants, uh, a research scientist and a research analyst, and a CQI student worker. Um, parts of their time are uh, go towards supporting CQI activities. Not all of it, but um, they have been trained in CQI methods and tools, um, and so we do have a team that is supporting our CQI activities. Um, so when I talk about our CQI teams, um, that's actually different than uh, the number of LIAs that we have. So our MICSI LIAs, obviously we, don't, we um, have a much fewer number than 46, but we do have 46 total CQI teams that are participating and that we have contact with and support. Um, there could be um, an LIA that has more than one CQI team because some of our LIAs are partnerships or um, they spread across a, a large uh, regional or geographic area. And so it makes sense in terms of the way that they do their work to have a smaller working CQI team. And you can see here that we do put, we, we kind of have them in tiers. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. And really that's just more for us internally to help um, determine how to support them, how to best provide technical assistance for them. And we really look at um, how they're funded, their program maturity, and their experience with CQI um, to determine how best to support them. So again, I'm not going to go through this slide in detail just because there's a lot of information here, but it gives you a sense of how we can provide tailored support to our different um, LIAs and programs. Um, so, for example, MICSI grantees have well-established programs and a solid understanding of CQI concepts. So we have frequent contact with them um, regarding their improvement efforts. They're doing some um, comprehensive assessments um, in terms of improvement opportunities, regular data review and reporting, um, and advanced training and application of CQI. And then all the way down to um, the final tier, which is more of our um, TANF-funded programs that may or may not be implementing an evidence-based home visiting program, but that we would still like to provide support to in terms of um, what does quality improvement look like in their program. Um, so similar to Louisiana, we have really leveraged a lot of the um, resources and technical assistance available through um, HRSA and HB Coin, and are so appreciative of all of um, the resources that we've been able to use. Um, we do use the model for improvement um, and have used the Institute for Healthcare Improvement Breakthrough Series Collaborative. So uh, that's what's shown on this slide. And um, as was mentioned earlier, there are these uh, times of action periods and then times when our CQI teams come together in person for a learning session where they're really trying to do um, some peer learning from each other. Um, within the last, I would say over the last three years, Minnesota has really moved into this approach. Um, before we started doing the learning collaboratives, it was really the LIAs were picking a topic on their own, trying to work through it from a quality improvement perspective, um, but really isolated in terms of how they were going about doing their QI. And we felt like we, it would, we'd really be able to show some advances in outcomes um, for families and provide um, a, a support network for our LIAs if we built in these peer learning activities. So we have moved towards using learning collaboratives for that reason. So um, this is just uh, showing which learning collaboratives we've done over the last three years. Um, we pick one topic um, to work on. So in 2017, we did screening and referral for developmental and social emotional risk as well as um, postpartum depression. We did family enrollment, engagement, and retention, and we're currently wrapping up a breastfeeding learning collaborative. Again, you can see that these are all topics that um, HB COIN has done, and so we've used their resources in order to do this. One thing that we discovered with this last learning collaborative is that we really wanted to pull in more um, input from LIAs to help ad, um, advise on how we, how we carried out the learning collaborative. 
And so we were able to pull in local home visiting partners, um, home visitors and um, supervisors and leaders from the local programs. And they really helped select the topic, create the aim for the project, select the measures and develop resources. Um, this has significantly helped build buy-in among our teams because we can say this group, which was made of um, local programs, really had a say in advising how this project will look. Um, and that has gone a really long way. We've been able to support um, some of those members uh, with some monetary funding for their travel and their time. Um, and that has, has really been a game changer for us. This is just an example of uh, typical activities and a timeline for a collaborative. Again, you can see um, there's a pre-work, there's an action period, two action periods, and between these action periods are when the um, teams get together for learning sessions, and then we do some, some, a summation session at the end. There's coaching calls and monthly um, reporting in between. Um, one of the largest challenges that we've um, encountered really has to do with um, measuring improvement and reporting. And we know that home visitors are really busy and want to be spending time with families. Um, but it's also important that we're able to show that we're improving practices and um, really improving outcomes for families as well. Um, so data collection is a required part of what we do, and um, there is monthly data submission, um, but it's often, or it is consistently the top challenge reported by our LIAs. So to address this, we've really tried to leverage the CQI advisory group to select and advocate for the um, measures chosen. Um, we really try to acknowledge the commitment and validate their feelings about, yes, this is hard, it's a little bit more work. Um, but how can we figure out a way to do this in a meaningful way? Um, and then we suggest ways for them to share their work among team members um, and then connect them to other LIAs who are doing this work. There's also other methods for CQI reporting and feedback that we have built in. Um, there's monthly data reporting, which I talked about. Our nurse consultants also monitor CQI efforts during one-to-one -one LIA meetings. Um, LIAs also submit grant progress reports to our grant managers, um, and they do have an opportunity to check in with us um, during a monthly check-in call, and so we are able to get a sense of how they're doing with their CQI activities during those check-in calls as well. In terms of sustaining and spreading, at the conclusion of each of our collaboratives, teams create a final poster that they present and share with us and with other LIAs. And then we, as an agency, create a topic toolkit, a final summary and a poster, which are uploaded to our webpage um, and are available on Basecamp, which we use as a platform for LIAs to share um, information with one another. Uh, we also um, post key project documents uh, for anyone to access on our website. And we're in the process of updating our website right now. Um, we also add the topic to ongoing home visiting community of practice that we have. And then again, we are you know, evaluating our CQI coaching as we go. So teams have the chance to report back to us um, and let us know how we're doing in terms of providing technical assistance and support to them. Um, there are some lessons learned uh, through the, the last few learning collaboratives that we have um, coordinated. So we know that strong um, intentional support from leadership is essential to a team's success. We also know that being flexible and meeting LIAs where they're at is really important. We try to incrementally increase their commitment. Um, so we're, we try to move at a pace that makes sense for them, but um, can also challenge them a little bit as well to stretch. Uh, we also practice what we preach. So we regularly engage LIAs in state CQI planning, implementation, and evaluation. Um, and then we uh, acknowledge when something isn't working, and we use it as an opportunity to demonstrate CQI learning and growth at the state, too. So we have made lots of adjustments along the way, especially around measurement um, and data collection and reporting. Um, so we try to practice what we preach. And with that, I know that was a really fast presentation and there was a lot of information on those slides. Um, so hopefully you'll have a chance to 
go back to them and take a look at some of the detailed information and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you so much, Meredith, and thanks again to both Meredith and Jessica for those great presentations with lots of strategies, and we always appreciate the plugs for the practicum and the coin. Um, so let's open it up for questions. There were a bunch of questions in the chat box earlier, so we'll start with those. Um, and then feel free, everyone, to please either um, chat in or raise your hand or um, jump in. I think lines are open as well. So the first question we got earlier was for Jessica and about the calls that you're having. And the question was, um, are they required calls, or do you ask LIAs to try and attend a certain percentage of them? Yeah, um, so for us, they are required. Um, but obviously, it's very difficult to get everybody um, on the call at the same time. Um, so. We haven't ever put out um, a percentage to, to try to attend, although I think that's certainly a good um, strategy. Um, we do track how many of our LAs are attending each call, and we've never gotten below like even 80% threshold, so it hadn't been something where we were too worried about, um, and it hadn't been like certain ones missing every call. Um, but we, it is a good idea to pay attention to who's calling in, um, but we do encourage everyone to attend or um, have a representative on each call. Great. Um, there was some interest in the Connect website. Was it PH Connect? It is. Can you talk I a little bit about I maybe that shouldn't have brought it up. <laughs> the reason we um, aren't we went away from it was because the website is now defunct. So we switched to our state SharePoint system. Okay, got it. Um, maybe this is a good point, Meredith, if you want to raise, um, suggest Basecamp and talk a little bit about that and how folks might want to use that since that's what you're yeah, using. Yeah, sure. So we um, started using Basecamp about a year and a half ago, and um, it is a, a similar, I'm assuming, a similar platform to other, um, other software where basically you can get on, it, it provides um, like a chat function, um, it's also a resource um, depository so you can uh, or a repository so you can um, you can uh, post uh, documents there um, and uh, and sites can connect with each other and communicate with each other and so we use that for CQI but we also use it for like our community of practice um, and just exchanging best practices great thanks um, another question for Jessica, and I think this one applies to Meredith too, although Meredith, you addressed it a little bit. So the question was, did you all experience any pushback from LIAs with sharing PDSAs and data um, and feedback with all the LIAs? And if so, how did you work through that? Um, so the answer is yes. Uh, hmm. And that, um, I guess with all of this work, uh, I would expect initial pushback in general. Um, I find it's people have a hard time adopting CQI because it does feel like extra work. Um, and every time we started something new, we get pushback um, or trying things in a different way. Um, and then as we progress and think they see the benefit from the work, uh, you get less pushback. Um, and so uh, I think that when we started implementing the regular deadlines, that did seem like a very big burden to the teams, but then they, when they, because we give feedback when they submit their data in PDSAs, um, they're seeing the benefit of posting it. So it's not like posting it and that goes to a void. Those of us on the statewide team are accountable to responding to what's posted. I don't know. Yeah, I would say yes. We also had some pushback. We did a lot of, um, coaching and still continue to do some, actually, even for teams that have been involved for a while, but it, it is slowly shifting. Like, we can see a shift with our teams in terms of making sure that they understand that the data is their data, and so it's, it, we're not judging them on their data. We're, we're just providing a platform for them to, to track their improvement, and so it's not looking at their data from, you know, a, a a judgmental place, but really just like how can you use your data to 
to help you um, figure out what's working and what's not working. But it was a reframing of um, how to look at data from a quality improvement standpoint and how that's different um, than maybe you know other data that's reported um, on outcomes or for other programs um, that people work on. So there was a lot of like just um, reframing that and having a lot of conversations um, and, and repeating those conversations as we go that we found that we did need to do some work around that. But I think we've really moved um, in the right direction. Thank you both. That's helpful. The next question um, I think is about an activity you mentioned in particular, Jessica, about um, eliciting fears and anxiety. Um, and the question is, was it fears and anxiety about the CQI topic or CQI in general? It covered both. <laughs> um, so, I, I, so we left it open and we got uh, feedback on both uh, areas, which was which was helpful, really. Great. Um, there's also a question about the relationship building strategies implemented in person. Um, and, or sorry, it's the question is, are most or all of these relationship building strategies implemented in person that you talked about, Jessica? Um, the, yes, uh, most of them were in person. Um, and I do think that it's, it's difficult to do if you don't have any in-person interaction. But we also really look to our action period, our monthly calls, to try to facilitate it um, there as well, which is why we have um, the LIAs do peer sharing, um, some things we've done on the calls that uh, seem to work well is if we ask, um, you know, we look at the data, point out specific things we're seeing in the data for each LIA and have them share on it and then open it up to questions from their peers. Um, the more specific you can get in pointed questions and, and trying to facilitate them asking questions to each other, I, the, the better we find those calls, and I think that's an element of uh, relationship building. Um, but it is tricky. I mean, we applied to the HV coin thinking we would do all of our learning sessions virtually. And when we um, started working with the National HV coin team, we were really strongly encouraged to at least do our first meeting in person. Um, and then it just went so well that our NICV program lead um, that it, you know, found the funds for us to do the remaining learning sessions in person. So I know that's not great news, because <laughs> it wasn't good news when I heard that. <laughs> we have also um, found it in Minnesota that those, when we do our um, evaluations after the learning collaborative, the thing that gets ranked the highest and um, it's really, the teams really value that time together. Um, it's, it can be tough um, because, you know, we have teams all over our state for them to make time to travel. Um, but usually they say that it's worth it and really to have that team time um, makes a big difference for them and, and they really like to build that into the project. Thank you both. So a related question um, is about what resources are available to provide those in-person meetings. Do you have any suggestions for how to find funding for those or what you've used in the past? So in Louisiana, uh, I had mentioned we used to have in-person, statewide in-person meetings um, with all the teams that we would tag on to with CQI. And uh, I think what ended up happening this year was our learning sessions replaced those meetings. So it was. Uh, the funding would have been built in at, for, into the contracts for each of um, the staff members. There's every staff person has some travel built in into their uh, into the budget, and so I think it fell in with that. And we were able to find locations um, that were either to host a meeting that were either free or uh, low cost. And in Minnesota, we do, um, our LIAs do have some funding in their grants 
um, from us in their MICVI grants for travel um, to participate in CQI uh, activities or meetings. Um, so they're able to budget for um, a couple of meetings um, through their grant, through their MICVI grant. And then we also, as I mentioned, have um, state evidence-based home visiting funding that we're also able to draw upon to support um, some of the CQI activities. Great. Thank you both, and thanks for answering all those questions. And thanks, everyone, for your great questions. There's one left, and that's about um, the number of pages due in terms of the CQI plan. And there is not a specific number of pages required for the CQI plan. You should take as much um, space as you need to answer the questions and include all of the necessary components. I'm going to turn it back over to Sarah now. And thanks again, everyone, for your participation. And thanks again to Meredith and Jessica for the great presentations. Great. Thank you all. Um, great questions and great discussion. Um, I'm going to quickly turn things over to Tricia Finnerty, who is joining us from HV Coin today, to share some upcoming opportunities um, for awardee and LA teams to further build their CQI skills. Tricia? Thanks, Sarah. Um, so as Sarah said, I'm Trisha Finnerty. I am one of the improvement advisors for HV COIN. And it was great to hear uh, both Jessica and Meredith uh, mention their participation in COIN. Um, and we wanted to share a few updates on uh, upcoming COIN opportunities as you all think about your CQI work and plans. Um, the Well Child Visit COIN, uh, this is our second cohort of the, the new topic work stream of COIN, uh, has launched. Uh, the first learning session was uh, last week. But there is still an opportunity to apply for Cohort 2 of SCALE. Uh, the application for the SCALE cohort uh, will be available on our COIN website uh, starting tomorrow and is going to remain open through um, May 2nd. And the topics for SCALE for Cohort 2 are going to be uh, breastfeeding, uh, maternal depression, and development. Um, as I said, the applications will be due by May 2nd, and we'll plan to hold an uh, in-person kickoff with the awardee teams in late summer, early fall, just to uh, give you a sense of the timing. Uh, we hope that you have seen uh, our advertising for our four-part virtual series. Um, this is going to provide uh, more information on what scale entails and uh, what breakthrough benefits you can achieve by participating in the COIN. Uh, we've included the link to the registration uh, here on the slide, uh, so please do attend if you have any questions or you're curious about uh, learning more. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, your participation in COIN is um, really encouraged to be included in your CQI plan. And as Julie mentioned, uh, guidance on incorporating uh, HV COIN into your CQI plan, um, so very specific language and examples, uh, can be found in the appendix of the instructions and uh, recommended template that are in the file share pod. Uh, so we hope that this is helpful uh, in both completing your CQI plan uh, and also seeing the alignment and benefits. Uh, so we're really excited about kicking off Cohort 2 and um, hope that you are too and might be interested in joining us. And if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to Mary McCrain. Sarah, I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you, Tricia. Um, and in our final minute here today, we're going to ask you to please take a moment um, and reflect on any action steps you plan to take based on the information you heard today. Um, so you'll see a few poll questions have popped up at the bottom of your screen. Uh, the first is, do you plan to take an action step based on this webinar, yes or no? Um, if you responded yes, we'd love to see a, a short description of the action step you plan to take. Um, and if you answered no, please uh, let us know what would have been helpful um, for you to identify an action step today. Um, and we will leave the poll questions up at the bottom here. Um, as we close, uh, we 
we are committed to um, improvement in our own work. So um, you'll see a link to a satisfaction survey on the slide. Also, when you close out of the webinar today, um, a, an evaluation survey will pop up. Um, it takes about five minutes to complete, um, and so we'd love your thoughts on any ways that we can improve webinars going forward. Um, thank you to all of our presenters and our attendees today. Uh, we hope you found this uh, an informative hour. And if there are any questions that you had that we didn't get to, please feel free to drop them in the chat, and we'll connect with you or reach out to your PMCQI PA specialist. Uh, and have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much.